As should be evident by now, the field of crisis communication is very diverse. Not only because the types of crises we are trying to understand are themselves global and diverse, but also because the field is still developing. As I've talked about before, I'd wanted to get a better understanding of where the field had come from as a way of arguing where the field was going. So I reviewed the broad body of journal articles published on crisis communication from 1953 to 2015. Of those 687 journal articles that I reviewed, 272 were practical or descriptive. That is, they had no theory connected to them. Of the 415 that remained, nearly a fifth of them used some combination of psychological, persuasion, or risk-based theories to guide their research and analysis. For the most part, the application of these theories focused on better understanding stakeholder attitudes and how those attitudes might inform crisis response. Moreover, in the last five or so years, we have seen the development of crisis-specific theories that apply these types of attitudinal constructs within the crisis context. So for this reason, it's important to have a strong understanding of the types of theories and attitudinal constructs that are informing the development of the field. Now, don't worry, we're not going to be reviewing every psychological persuasion and risk theory applied in crisis communication, but I wanted to highlight the key constructs and theories that are shaping our understanding of stakeholder attitudes, culture, and emotion within crisis communication. Focusing on the formulation of attitudes is consistent with most of the approaches in persuasion research where theories like the health belief model or extended parallel process model emphasize the importance of understanding the implication of constructs like perceived susceptibility, severity, beliefs, demographics, and perceived efficacy as predictors of reactions to stimuli and situations. For that reason, it's really important that we understand the theories that have been instrumental in helping us develop this understanding of stakeholder attitudes. We'll begin with the theory of reasoned action, which I don't summarize in the textbook too much, but it's useful because it was a forerunner to the theory of planned behavior, which we'll also take a look at in this podcast. Welcome to our discussion of the theory of reasoned action. Before we begin, let me give you a little bit of a rationale as to why we look at so many different theories in the class. Theory is important because it's the basis for creating an informed campaign. It helps us to create effective messages, develop an a good needs assessment, identify our objectives, and measure the outcomes of particular campaigns. So in discussing this theory, I'm going to take a look at the background, components, limitations, and applications of the theory of reasoned action. So I think it's a nice place to begin by getting to know the authors of the theory just a little bit. The primary author for the theory of reasoned action was Martin Fishbein. Uh, we only recently lost him, and as you can see from his resume, he had a pretty holy cow kind of a career. In short, one of the reasons to understand who the authors are are to see some of the applications and some of the real world work that um, academics and researchers in persuasion do. This is one of the fields of communication where we literally affect lives. And, and that's kind of the neat part about persuasion research, is that it should be about reaching out and doing good in order to help people. So Martin Fishbein is the preliminary author on TRA, and the secondary author is really Isaac Azen. Now, he's a former student of Fishbein, which is what you find a lot of times in academia when you see two authors who work a lot together. It's pretty common that they, it was, it was uh, a student-professor kind of relationship during graduate school that then, because of mutual interests, grows into really a lifelong opportunity for collaboration. So these two guys really, they got together early in, in um, the 1960s and 70s, and they were frustrated with where the field of, of attitude and voluntary behavior was. 
we didn't really understand what drove people to volitional behavior or voluntary behavior. So the theory was born out of frustration. Um, in a lot of research, there are weak correlations between attitude and voluntary behavior. There was something missing. You know, we talked about when we discussed attitudes that there is not a perfect correlation between your attitude and your behavior. Attitude is a good indicator, but it wasn't the thing that was really driving it. So what they were trying to do was understand the relationships that really drove behaviors. And so they began with a couple of relationships. And what we're going to do is we'll walk through each of the components of the theory one at a time. So they started with the assumption and then tested this through quite a lot of research that our behavioral intention often leads to our behavior. That, that was kind of the truth of, of our attitude, what we are planning on doing. That's a good indicator of what our actual behavior is going to be. So think of behavioral intention as my New Year's resolution. You know, if I make a New Year's resolution to exercise every day, and I, and I say I'm committed to this, that's my behavioral intention. Now the behavior is then whether I actually do that or not. So in trying to figure out what then affected behavioral intention, Fishbein and Azen came up with, with several factors. First, our attitudes. So think of the attitude as our beliefs about the behavior. You know, do we think that this is a behavior that's actually going to benefit us in the end? We talked about this when we talked about attitudes and the formation of them, etc. But it's not just enough about to have an attitude about the outcome of the behavior. We also have to feel like those outcomes are going to be beneficial for us. So if I think that exercising every day is going to help me out, I form a positive attitude about exercise. And if I have a positive attitude about exercise, hopefully that informs my intention to exercise every day, thus leading to the behavior. But it's not just attitude. This is where it gets a little bit more complex because if we only if we did everything that we had a positive attitude about would probably be a lot healthier happier but there's a second component in here the subjective norm the subjective norm is really much more about our belief about the desirability of the behavior you know when we talk about exercise is it something that people view as a good thing is being healthy valued in your society? Subjective norms focus on the social desirability or the acceptability of the behaviors that we're ultimately trying to get to. So we create this, but we have to understand the belief about the behaviors desirable to specific others. See, it's not just whether there's a general social desirability as in, you know, does society in general care about what we do? That's not who we're concerned about when we're making decisions. Who we're concerned about are the people that we care about, our family, our friends. So if we're doing something, we think about what others are going to think about it, the, the, the people close to us. So it's a belief about the behavior as being desirable. If someone thinks that, you know, exercise is just going to inconvenience you or it's going to hurt you or whatever the case may be, and they start voicing that opinion, we may be worried that, that they're going to approve. Now, exercise is probably a bad example of this, but let me give you a different example. In Africa, one of the key problems with people even getting tested for HIV is that their family and their friends have such a strong stigma against people who are HIV positive that they're afraid that if they are tested and they find out that they're HIV positive, that they're going to be shunned by their community. And in fact, that belief and that concern is well-grounded. 
That's what we're talking about when we're talking about the subjective norm. Is that the belief that the behavior will, the belief that the behavior is desirable to the people who matter to us. But not only that, but the subjective norm is also about whether we care about those people's beliefs or our motivation to comply with them. Let me give you kind of a silly example. I have a lot of tattoos because I like tattoos. I have a positive attitude towards them. But you know, one of the things that I thought about before I got my first one at 18 was whether my folks would like that or not. Now, you know, at 18, I'm, I was still kind of, um, it mattered what they thought, let's say in the grand scheme of the universe. And I knew that they wouldn't like it. So that was the negative component, the belief about the behaviors being desirable from the specific other. My folks, I knew, wouldn't really like it. Yet, my motivation to comply with their belief was pretty small. In the grand scheme of things, I wasn't going to make the decision to put or not put something on my body because my folks might not like it. So what ended up happening was that I got it and concealed it. Now my mom, being, you know, moms and less, and less obnoxious about things usually, depends on the mom, you know, she saw and she was like, why do you do that to your body? My father didn't see any of my tattoos for a good decade. Now, did it stop me from getting them? No, because my motivation to comply with their beliefs was pretty low. But it was certainly something that I thought about and had to weigh in consideration. So think about it this way. Now, this before you freak out, it is an equation. But this is one way that the theory of reasoned action is portrayed is as an equation. BI, your behavioral intention, equals your attitude about performing the behavior combined with the weight or the importance about your attitude. You know, is it, does your attitude matter more than all? In the case of, of getting a tattoo, my attitude was pretty positive and that was ultimately the most important motivator was that my affect towards getting it was great. That's the W how important that component is to the individual. And then you add that with the subjective norm. How are others going to feel about that behavior? And combined with how important that component is. So it's the balancing act, right? It's adding things up. And if you get your behavioral intention is the result of a combination about the attitude and how important your belief is compared to what other people, specific other people, might think about and how important that is. That's the balance. So this is a good way to remember what the TRA is really about and how it combines everything. But like all theories, all theories have limitations. So like all theories, the theory of reasoned action has a few limitations. There's the question of goal intention versus behavioral intention. You know, we may have the goal to lose weight. That might be a lofty intention, but that's an entirely different intention than our behavioral likelihood or our behavioral intent to eat better. You know, we might say, hey, we're kind of chubby, I'd like to lose weight, but I don't like food that's good for me. So we can have a goal that could somewhere lead to behavior, but without the same behavioral intention it doesn't matter. So the limitation with TRA is that it only looks at behavioral intention. It doesn't really consider what our overall goals are. It's only looking at what it is, what specific behaviors we plan on actually executing. A second limitation is that the available choice affects our intention as well as thinking about the role the intention has in the behavioral performance. Let's, let's put this in this way. One of the problems with McDonald's is its availability and cost in urban environments. So one of the reasons that people a lot of times in urban environments make really bad food decisions is based on what's readily available. 
if you live in for example downtown Poughkeepsie there really isn't a grocery a good grocery store within walking distance of anywhere in downtown Poughkeepsie you can catch the bus you can have it delivered but there certainly is a McDonald's and a whole slew of fast food and kind of ooky food choices and they're cheap so the available choice a lot of times will affect whether we intend to do something you know I may choose I may want to eat better but if the choice for the money you know I can spend two bucks a day I can get something that's cheap and disgusting and and still feel full rather than than buying sometimes more expensive foods now the role of intention and behavioral performance is another limitation so if what's available is pretty limited then our intention doesn't really matter I might intend to eat well but if I don't have something that's good and that meets my my financial needs then the behavior isn't going to correlate with the intention so there's a weakness there in terms of our actual ability to execute our behavioral intention that's what this limitation is about is our actual ability to execute the behavioral intention so these limitations then mean that they're it's a good theory it's a theory that's been well supported but it's not a perfect theory there's no perfect theory so let's take a look at the the uh, another limitation is that there's a difference between the intention and the expectation so I may fully intend on someday living in a mansion thus the picture on the left but I don't actually expect to we can have an incongruence in what we want what what it is that we have as a goal and what we actually expect to do it may be that I I because I'm a professor I may never expect to make a ton of money true story but that's a conversation for another day but I may intend someday to live in in that mansion that incongruence short of you know winning the lottery is is one of the challenges with the TRA we can intend on to do a lot of different kinds of behaviors but sometimes we don't expect to do them effectively sometimes we don't expect to be successful we'll still try because it's worth a shot buying a lottery ticket it's worth a shot do we expect to win not unless you know we're really bad at math so that's that's a big part of understanding the one of the limitations of it so in the end when you understand the core limitations those limitations being very simply that the TRA doesn't measure goal intention it only measures and addresses behavioral intention that our available choices can route around our intention to actual behavior and that there's a difference between intention and expectation we understand that it can be an effective and useful theory but it has some distinctive limitations so let's take a look at the applications of the theory of reasoned action one has certainly been in advertising um, there's a couple of studies that looked at coupons so to what extent does a coupon actually affect your intention to go to you know Carl's jr you get this coupon and say "Ooh, it's free I can just get it you know all I have to do is buy a medium drink and I can get the burger or the chicken sandwich and as it turns out that's one of the reasons that coupons are effective is that they do change our behavioral intention we might buy a product or we might go to a business that we had never planned on on patronizing thus this gives us a very good idea about one of the ways that we can affect behavioral intention is to offer a lure of some kind a more common example of how the TRA is applied is in healthcare settings health campaigns specifically focusing on STDs and HIV 
you know, this is where, like I mentioned, um, a lot of the work on the, the theory of reasoned action has been put into place. In, in Africa, there's a, a um, friend of mine is doing research on the radio campaigns or tr he, the goal of the research is to help people view getting tested as more socially desirable. It is a campaign focused almost entirely on the subjective norms about HIV testing. Because of the substantial sto social stigma associated with being HIV positive, so one of the things that they have done in, in the course of this campaign is to develop a radio program. Now, before you kind of wonder about the radio programs, remember that radio in this country used to be, you know, our form of soap opera. That used to be our major form of entertainment. Well, in a lot of places in Africa, that still is. T you know, in the very poor places, the places where HIV is most prevalent, the radio is still the central form of entertainment. So they will, you know, most households or most villages will at least have a radio. So they do a radio program with people talking about HIV. They have characters, they follow them, they talk about the trials, the tribulations of being HIV positive, and they're trying to show it as being something that is normal. That you can, you have support systems, etc. I mean, because if you look at this graphic of the on the African map, this is talking about the density of HIV infection in Africa. So trying to identify the social norms and trying to manage those so that people get the treatment and people get the testing that they need is absolutely essential. So this is one of the very real applications and probably the one both in the United States and abroad that has received the most work with the theory of reasoned action. There are other types of health campaigns though too. Exercise campaigns a lot of times use the theory of reasoned action to change people's attitudes, not so much the subjective norms, but a lot of times the attitudes. Um, the one area on subjective norms that, it, that exercise campaigns sometimes address is whether we care about other people's impressions of us. We all like to create the illusion that we don't, but the reality is, is making it view, viewed more, much more as a social desire, socially desirable thing to do. Go exercise, make it a social event, make it something that that you do together. Family, family health campaigns, family exercise campaigns are really geared around that. It's also about changing people's attitudes. You know, making it so that it's actually fun to get out and move. Um, so this, there's a lot of applications, especially in the health communication context for these. Another common application in health is smoking cessation. The theory of reasoned action is used a lot in smoking cessation campaigns, <clears throat> making it look socially less desirable to smoke. If you remember a few years back, the um, tobacco industry, in particular Philip Morris, um, because they were mandated, not because they actually wanted to, but launched a fairly substantial campaign based on social desirability on youth smoking. You know, they, they, um, the one that's the series of commercials that stuck with me the most is that have teens in a social situation, one kid would light up and then they suddenly have a face of a monkey transposed onto their head. They're showed as being socially undesirable. So the theory of reason and action is used to really, a lot of the times, focus on that subjective norms component. And the final health campaign that this is used a lot with is in terms of uh, binge drinking and, and alcohol campaigns targeted towards college-age students in particular. So across the gambit, you know, whether we're talking about commercial campaigns or the, the more common one, health campaigns, we really get a sense that when we talk about attitudes, changing attitudes and changing the subjective norm, the theory of reasoned action can be an effective campaign strategy, i.e. theory, to ground those campaigns. All right, that's all for now, and more later.
In our continuing love of persuasion theory, this time we're going to look at the theory of planned behavior. This theory is a bit different because it's an extension of the theory of reasoned action. Now often you'll find that theories are further researched, developed, and, and oftentimes altered to address the specific constraints of those theories. So why talk about the theory of reasoned action? Why not just talk about this, the theory of planned behavior? The reason is that you want to use the simplest theory in order to meet your goals the best for your persuasion or your persuasive campaign. So where the theory of reasoned action can work, it should be used. Think of this as really the path of least resistance. So if the problem is about attitudes and subjective norms, then the theory of reasoned action should be used. But if it's a little bit more than that, if you're trying to cover one of those weakness areas that we discussed with the theory of reasoned action, then the theory of planned behavior may offer a better solution to it. So let's take a look at the theory of planned behavior. In the evolution of the theory, Azen, who we talked about as one of the primary authors on the theory of reasoned action, was disquieted by some of the weaknesses and the limitations of the theory of reasoned action. You know, as a reminder, uh, one, of the, one of the weaknesses was, the, was that there isn't a one-to-one -one relationship between behavioral intention and actual behavior. And in fact, that there are circumstances that there are, and limitations that can get in the way of someone's intent to do some action and whether they actually can. Now, if you think about the example that we used, one of the, the challenges with promoting healthy eating lifestyles is that in urban environments, there's often a lack of of ready availability towards good foods, good grocery stores even. And sometimes it's a lot easier and a lot less expensive to eat kind of yuki or unhealthy options. So this is one of those things that if you're trying to develop a persuasive campaign, you have to get around the availability issues. You have to figure out how to inconvenience people and make them be willing to make sacrifices in order to get food that's better for them. And this is what Azen was trying to, trying to address. So let's take a look at, at the extension of the theory of reason and action with planned behavior. Now if you look at this, those top two factors, the attitude and the subjective norm, along with intention and behavior, are exactly what we talked about before. What Azen added in was a third factor, our perceived behavioral control. Now we're going to spend the rest of our time talking about perceived behavioral control, but he argued that our, our ability, or at least our perception of our ability, to actually enact the behavior is not only going to affect our intention, but also the actual act of doing the behavior altogether. So let's take a look at perceived behavioral control. Very simply, it is about our perception of our ability to perform an action. Notice perception is key here. This isn't about whether or not we could actually go to a grocery store, whether there was an easy and inexpensive bus route to go to a grocery store, but it's about our perceived inconvenience and our perceived ability to actually get there. Remember, we can tell ourselves a lot as human beings. Sometimes we lie to ourselves. So our perception is the critical component of this. Now, how Azen came to this notion of perceived behavioral control was to borrow from another social psychologist, Albert Bandura, who was a founding author of self-efficacy, but in this case, Azen used the social cognitive theory to really develop this, this um, theory. So in addition to the attitudes and subjective norms, which make up the theory of reason action, the theory of planned behavior added the concept of perceived behavioral control originating in self-efficacy theory, and self-efficacy theory was grounded from Bandura. He worked on both self-efficacy theory and social cognitive theory. We'll talk about efficacy in a minute. Don't worry, hang with me here. But social cognitive theory is a learning theory based on the ideas that people learn by watching what others do, and that the human thought processes are central to understanding personality. So while a social cognitive psychologist would agree that there's a fair amount of influence 
um, on the development generated by learned behaviors dis uh, displayed in our environment where we actually grow up, they believe that the individual is just as important in determining their own development and what we learn. So the bottom line is that people learn by observing others with they learn in a particular environment and those behaviors are all chief factors in influencing our development in any particular area. So these three factors, who we are as a person, our behaviors, and our environment are not static or independent, but they all interact. They're all reciprocal to one another. So for example, any time that we observe someone acting, any behavior we witness can actually change our thinking, those personal determinants. Similarly, the environment that we're raised in may influence much later behaviors. So just like, you know, our father's mindset will also determine the environment in which he's raised or he raises his kids. So if we're trying to, you know, get our kids a better life, we may try to move to a different area, different school district, a different place in order to further their potential. But at the same time, it's our own decision making process that helps guide us there. All of these things are related. So when we come to this notion of, of what we're trying to do, how we're trying to affect our environment, how our environment affects us, and how all of this combines to affect our behaviors, Bandura argued that this concept of self-efficacy was really the best way to understand how it is that we learn and how it is that we think we're able to perform actions. So let's take a look at a broad definition, definition of efficacy. Efficacy at its most basic sense is our belief in our ability to perform a specific action as well as making a prediction about what will happen when we perform that action. According to Bandura, our expectations, like our motivation, our performance, and even our feelings of frustration associated with repeated failures, determine how we view be particular behaviors as well as our reactions to those behaviors. So he, he separated efficacy into two distinctive types, self-efficacy and outcome efficacy. He defines self-efficacy as the conviction that we can successfully execute a behavior. My belief in my ability to do physics, for example. The outcome expectancy is when we estimate how important that behavior will be. So if we think about, you know, if I learn how to to do physics, is there good that's going to come from that? That's the outcome efficacy. So, you know, if I learn, if I learn how to play the piano, for instance, I may end up with a really high sense of self-efficacy that I can play the heck out of the piano. But if playing the piano doesn't get me anything, I might have a low sense of outcome expectancy that even if I do my very best at playing the piano, I will never be playing for in Carnegie Hall. Those are both perceptions and expectations, but they're very different forms. So we're going to spend some time talking about each of them. So first, let's take a look at what self-efficacy is and is not. First, Self-efficacy is most definitely our belief in our ability to perform some action. You know, I, I know it's a little cheesy. You should expect that by now. But the little engine who could, that's sort of the metaphor for self-efficacy. You think and you are very confident in your ability to execute a particular action. Now, efficacy is specific to specific actions and to specific contexts. So, whereas I may have a high level of efficacy when it comes to communication, researching communication, reading about it, doing communication, whether that's interpersonally, organizationally, in public relations, 
I have a pretty high level of efficacy in communication. That doesn't mean that I have a high level of efficacy when it comes to physics. So it's not that this changes our global sense about our ability to do anything. It is specific to particular actions. Now it even can be specific to particular contexts. You know, I might be a very good uh, researcher, but I may not be very good at applied communication. You know, it's, it's not just that we have these universal sets of actions that we're comfortable with, that we're confident in. They're, it's all very interdependent. It's all very related to specific. So efficacy, the more specific we can be about it, the more clear it is. So, you know, if we use an example of, of uh, exercising, do I have confidence in my ability to get up every day, get up early enough every day, get on the treadmill, walk 30 minutes before, you know, I go on about my day. That doesn't mean that I would expect to be able to go out and play soccer for 90 minutes. That's what I mean by specific actions and specific contexts. Now, a lot of times the notion of self-efficacy gets confused with a couple of other things. So it is not the same as self-esteem. Self-esteem is really a more global sense of ourselves. Efficacy focuses on our ability to achieve specific goals. So the kitten versus the lion. You know, the, the, the picture is about self-esteem. We may have very high levels of self-efficacy in terms of specific actions, specific fields, but we may not like ourselves. The two are just not related. And that's an important thing to note, that self-efficacy has no relationship to self-esteem. Direct, anyhow. Also, it's not the same as confidence. Confidence is sort of a pop culture term that we see tossed around on things like Dr. Phil. Confidence is supposed to be some kind of nebulous, I am confident that I can do X, Y, or Z. No. A lot of the times when we're talking about conf confidence, we're conflating how we view ourselves with specific actions. From an academic sense, view it in terms of self-efficacy and self-esteem. Don't refer to confidence as the concepts that we're measuring because it gets very confusing as to what's what. It's kind of like chasing a jackalope. In theory, but in practice, not so much. So let's take a look at the effects of self-efficacy on human behavior. Why is this an important component of the theory of planned behavior? First, it really governs our choices regarding behaviors. The bottom line is that we like doing things that we feel like we're successful at. We don't like doing things that we're expecting to fail at. And think about that for a minute. This makes sense. So if I'm confident in my ability to do communication, why would I go try physics out? We like to feel good about the work that we're doing, and a lot of the time, whether we can do it well ends up being, you know, whether we like it or not. Maybe a sport that we played when we were kids, maybe it wasn't our first choice, but it's the one that we were good at. Larry Walker, who's a pretty much has a Hall of Fame career, um, played baseball for the Colorado Rockies. It wasn't the sport he loved the most. He's Canadian. So what's the sport he loved the most? Hockey. He wasn't as good at hockey. So, but what he chased in terms of the sport that he played was the one he was really good at. So self-efficacy affects the, our choices regarding behavior. Second, it also affects our motivation. You know, if we're good at something, it's a whole lot more fun to go do. If we feel like we're banging our head against the wall every single day and just not getting better, it's a lot rougher to try and actually work up the motivation to do a particular behavior. You know, um, I am not particularly gifted at 
bowling, and, and let me assure you, neither is my husband. It's not something, it's not that I dislike the game, but it's awfully hard to be motivated to go play it when I know that my score is going to be somewhere around 100. Out of 300, that doesn't make me feel warm and fuzzy. So, motivation and our confidence in our ability to do something end up being pretty well tied together. Next, self-efficacy can be a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. When we have, when we really believe that we can do a behavior, we're probably going to be more successful at it. We put in the work. We, we, we really just focus on our ability to act. If, however, we don't have a high degree of self-efficacy, we are much more likely to be critical of ourselves. We're much more likely to look for examples of our failure at our infinite suckage, if you will. So it is a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. We talk ourselves into sometimes being good and bad at things. Yeah, there is a basic reality that some of our natural abilities, I am never going to be, you know, a, um, I don't know, what was it? A, a star beach volleyball player. One, I'm too short, and two, I don't have a vertical jump to, cor to uh, outweigh the being too short, and, and three, I'm just, you know, I'm all right at it. I can live on, on some beach volleyball if I go and not, not embarrass myself, but there's a whole world of difference. So what if I were to try? I don't have the, the belief in my ability to do that enough to be willing to go try. Understand that sometimes the self-fulfilling prophecy is us being realistic with ourselves. On the negative side, we see in education, for example, a lot of the time that kids get very discouraged. Children who are from homes where the parents didn't high, have a high level of educational success are told from an early age, hey, I wasn't good in school. I don't expect you to be either. That actually has a substantial negative effect on their self-efficacy when it comes to studying, when it comes to, you know, basically just learning. This is actually one of the biggest inhibitors for students from socioeconomically disadvantaged households. If you look at the urban, the results for urban poor and education, what we find is this notion of the self-fulfilling prophecy. The parents don't have confidence in their abilities to be, to be educated, and they really pass that on through their communication, and they build really a culture of failure in school, an expectation that kids are not going to do well in school because they didn't, because of lack of resources, whatever it might be. Building efficacy is one of the big strategies that I see a lot of people doing when they're trying to change educational achievement in underdeveloped and school districts, school districts that are struggling. It's a very powerful concept, this notion of self-efficacy. Another effect is mastery. Oh, sorry, that, those are all of our effects. But we want to take a look at the uh, factors that affect self-efficacy. So how do we build self-efficacy? Self now, what you're going to notice is that there isn't a lot of pop psychology fluff. Ooh, let's make it everybody feel good and sing kumbaya around the campfire. This is actually effective. You know, um, a friend of mine and I were talking about a book just today. Um, let's see, what was the title of that book? It was, it was Nurture Shock talking about what's wrong with our, with education and a lot of the, the experiences of our kids is that it's, it's grounded in fluff. It's grounded in, in self-esteem kinds of concerns rather than in building efficacy. What you'll notice with the factors that affect self-efficacy is that it is very much grounded in, in things that make sense. So let's start with the mastery experience. If you with each success that you have doing something, you build self-efficacy. So a teacher's job is to help students be successful. 
to give them the tools that they need in order to achieve. Hard work. When when someone feels that payoff when they're when they're doing an activity for the first time, they they see improvement in their performance no matter what it is. When you can see the improvement, it gives a it gives you a much stronger sense that you can actually do the behavior. So you get past those first two weeks of dieting and your pants start to feel a little bit looser. That gives you a positive affirmation that you're doing the right thing and that you can actually do it. So it's not just that you have the tools in front of you, it's that you have the tangible experience of doing the behavior and doing it well. So that's one of the factors that affects self-efficacy. A second factor that affects self-efficacy is modeling or vicarious experience. So maybe we haven't had the opportunity to get our hands on whatever it is, but we see others. We see others do it successfully. A lot of times when we are approaching a behavior that seems very difficult, let's say quitting smoking, that's something that for people, because it's an addiction, is incredibly difficult. A lot of times if we have the stories of people who have done it well or who have been successful in quitting smoking, it helps us. If we think about, in a related sense, um, recovery from alcohol addiction. Going to AA, one of the reasons that you're matched up with a sponsor, someone who's also an alcoholic, is the modeling or the vicarious experience. Those are folks who have been sober for long enough that, and, and are stable enough in their sobriety that they can be an example. The concept of leading by example is vicarious experience. So when we see others perform very challenging tasks and perform them well, we get the notion that we can do it too. So the factor affecting self-efficacy with vicarious experience says that even if we haven't yet had that experience, that mastery experience, we can still build self-efficacy by seeing good examples of it. And a lot of times, that's where we start. A third factor that can affect self-efficacy is what's called as social persuasion. Bottom line, being encouraged or discouraged. Is there a behavior that we're encouraged to take up? You know, did our parents sit down with us and help us study? You know, in my folks' case, one of the things that I'm very appreciative of is that my folks read with me. And they said, hey, do what you want. You, you know, you can, there's nothing that you can't do if you work hard enough. Obviously, when you're little, when you're five and you want to have a, um, you know, a nightclub where you're a singer, they're, they're cautious with that. But as you actually do things, as you're good in school, as you're good in athletics, whatever it is, if you have people around you who are offering you the positive, self, positive support, it's a lot easier to build the confidence or your belief in your ability to execute those actions well. That's why the good game um, that's why having coaches who say good job to you is important. And likewise, if we're discouraged from exhibiting particular behaviors, we probably are going to be less, less sure that we can perform them effectively. You know, if the first time that we do a math problem, someone looks at us and says, wow, that was what you did? You're going to suck at math. That's a form of a very powerful form of social persuasion. So that definitely affects our ability to, to look at a task and say, hey, I can do this. So social persuasion is another factor. The final factor that I want to talk about are the psychological factors. So these are the perceptions of or negative feelings before performing a behavior. Think about it this way. We can talk ourselves out of stuff. Um, I have seen people get up to give speeches and they psych themselves out. They think about all the things that could go wrong with what they're doing instead of all the things that can go right. 
this is what I'm talking about with the psychological factors. It is the story that we tell ourselves, you know, if we focus on the negative, if we focus on how nervous we are instead of focusing on whatever it is that we're actually trying to do, we're probably going to make some mistakes. And because of the mastery experience, the more negative our experience is, the more we re reinforce that self-fulfilling prophecy, the harder it is to overcome. So one of the critical factors in affecting people's self-efficacy is getting them to tell the right story to themselves. If they're nervous, to focus on the preparation process so that they can be confident in their execution. They can believe in their ability to execute a particular behavior. So the psychological factors can't be underestimated by any means. So if we look at self-efficacy, our belief in our ability to perform a specific action in a specific context. Can we complete this class? That's what self-efficacy is. On the other hand, response efficacy is asking whether if we complete the task, it's going to matter. You know, if you graduate with your master's, what does it matter? One of the questions, as you noticed on our uh, introductions, is asking why you're in this program. In part because I like to help keep reminding people that of what it is that they think they're going to get when they get out of here. It's a motivator. It's a reason why even when you know you're cursing my name, why it's a good thing to be in a master's program, to be in a bachelor's program, to be taking a class, no matter at what level it is, is to try and ask yourselves what it is that you want to get out of this program. That's an example of response efficacy. If you can answer that graduating with your bachelor's, graduating with your master's is something that's actually going to get you towards your life goals, then you're going to keep doing it. So response efficacy is our prediction of our likely outcomes. If we work hard, if we run every day, are we going to win the Olympics? We can work hard and run every day and be confident in our ability to do that, but if we don't see much of a point to it, not that winning the Olympics is the only goal there, but if we don't see much of a point to it, we're probably not going to do it. So at its heart, response efficacy is about asking the question, will a behavior have a desirable effect? One of the things that kept my dad from trying to quit smoking for about 40 years, 40 that is, was that he thought, huh, I've already been smoking for a long time. I've probably already hurt myself. So even if I go through the pain, struggle, and nuisance of quitting, I've already polluted my lungs, my arteries, whatever it might be. This was, an, this was actually what he would say when he would talk about why it was that he wasn't willing to, to try quitting smoking. He didn't feel like there would be a desirable effect, even if he believed that he could. So if you think about the ways that response efficacy and self-efficacy work together, it's really about our prediction of likely outcomes. Will the behavior matter enough to make a difference? So... One of the, the core problems with voting behaviors is that a lot of times, and whether or not people vote, the United States, we have a terrible voter turnout. And a lot of times when you poll people, it's because they don't think that their vote matters. So what do you do to try and change that? You try and change the response efficacy. Try to make them believe that every vote matters. That if they're doing it, if they're getting out, if they're voting, they're a part of the process. So... Response efficacy is not only, you know, will it matter at a very large level, have a de desirable effect, but will it have enough of a positive desirable effect to make a difference? That's the core challenge with, with efficacy. It's, it's not just that we have a belief in our ability to do the behavior, but the behavior itself is going to result in something useful. So let's take a look at an example of the theory of planned behavior, taking kind of everything into consideration. 
So, kind of a simple example, getting out of bed at a decent time, or getting to bed, out of bed too for that matter, getting enough sleep. This is something that we know we should do. So we know our attitude, we know that getting enough sleep is good for us. You know, there's a positive attitude affect. So we probably have that adds to our intention to be in bed at decent hours of the day. You know, a lot of times when we're having health issues, one of the questions that our doctors will ask, the subjective norm, is that our doctor will recommend X amount of hours of sleep. Now, as you get older, you need less sleep. People who are call it traditional college age, 18 to 21, that's actually when you need the most sleep that you need in your life, is from 18 to 21. You'd actually need, you know, research varies, but between eight and a half and nine and a half hours. Yet this is also a time in our lives when we don't tend to get that much sleep. So what does the, you know, how much sleep should we be getting? That's a subjective norm. We're looking to someone outside and, and we're deciding whether we care whether what care what they say or not. But the the uh, challenge here, the perceived control, is that it may be hard to get to bed at eleven. Um, you know, I have other stuff to do. If I go to bed I can't get to sleep. Hey, I'm used to less sleep. So that perceived control that even if we do it, we're not going to get enough sleep, or I have other things to do, that affects our confidence and our ability to do the action. So it can affect our intention to be in bed by 11 each night during the week, and it can actually directly interfere with the relationship between our intention and our behavior. So, let's say I go to bed at 11, and I sit there thinking about the fact, or lay there thinking about the fact, that I need to get to sleep. This is not a recipe for getting to sleep, as you all know. So, then, I have my alarm set for 7 a.m. I know I need to be up, I don't have to be anywhere, because, you know, I'm a college professor, so I don't have to be anywhere. So then I move my alarm clock back. You know, it's suddenly it's 12.30 at night, so I move my alarm clock back to 8.30. Maybe I can't. Maybe I actually have to get out of bed. So then I do with less sleep. I fulfill that self-fulfilling prophecy that, hey, I can deal with less sleep. There's a thousand variations as to where this can run amok. Even though the attitude and the subjective norm are there, we know we should, we have every intention, it's that perceived control. It's the voice in our head, the little angel or devil on our shoulder, if you will, that's interfering not only with our actual intention of being to bed, but the behaviors that we would need to support that. So this is why I say when, when you have the opportunity to focus on attitudes and subjective norms, you use the theory of reason and action. But when when there's something there that perceived control, a problem of efficacy, either self-efficacy or the response efficacy, then you should really think about the theory of planned behavior because that's where your campaign is probably going to target is the perceived control component. If the problem is about the subjective norm or the attitude, you'd probably go with the theory of reason and action. All right, that's all for now, folks. Have a good one.